Hi, I'm Mary schutz weissman Programme Coordinator for the Culture of Prosperity Programme here at the Legatum Institute. And we are very lucky to have Philip Blom, author of Fracture, Life and Culture in the West, 1918 to 1938, um, here to deliver the final lecture of our History of Capitalism lecture series in 2015, which is After the Crash and Before the War, Life and Culture in the 1930s. Welcome. Thank you. So the 1930s were not peaceful years in Europe by any stretch of the imagination and the political uh, goings-on have been described in great detail, but can you give us a bit of a flavour of the 1930s culturally in a few words? In a few words, that's not simple, but um, it's a time of broken hope. It's a time when the hope to escape the dynamic of the First World War is finally broken by the world economic crisis, by the Great Wall Street crash. And countries slide back into anarchy and well, you know the civil wars that happened across Europe from Hungary and Austria to Italy to then, of course, Spain. Um, France is at the brink of it. Germany is sliding into fascism. It is a very dramatic time, but I think culturally you find that there's a sort of answer to what went on in the 1920s. The 1920s were a decade that was, first of all, overshadowed by the terrible understanding of how senseless this war had been, that they'd just been fighting, that they'd all been betrayed, and that is really across the boards and across the fronts. That's the common feeling people have. They've been betrayed by the people who've been commanding them. But then in the later 20s, you get a, f a feeling of hope again, a feeling of we can do this. Um, the civil unrest dies down, economies are stabilizing, there is a feeling that it can go on after all, and that is shattered by the Wall Street crash. And artists, well, many of them in the 1930s reach for the stars. Either they are very prescient, think of Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, where he describes literally how a little man is sucked into a machine, swallowed by a machine, and um, that's sort of where we are now. But um, that is also part of a larger narrative that I will want to talk about in my lecture, this narrative of the machines are winning. Yeah, and I think we have this narrative at the moment, which is yes. uh, very much, you know, what is the future of life with robots? How are we going to interact? How are they going to benefit society as opposed to... And that is a, that is yeah. a preoccupation, almost an obsession that comes from the 1920s, from these interwar years. Of course, you had millions of people who had been very terribly injured in the war, who had lost limbs, who had lost half their face, and who had prosthetic limbs. And you were used to people in the street who were half men and half machine. Yeah. And you find then there's the cinematic remake of Frankenstein. There is Metropolis, where an evil robot seduces the masses. There is a, a Czech writer called Karel Čapek, who writes a play called Are You Are Universal Robots, and introduces the word robot into our vocabulary. And it's a play about the machines taking over and killing humans. So you see this cultural preoccupation with this machine, which of course gives us ease, gives us wealth, gives us added possibilities, but also contains terrible threats. So you mentioned the 1929 is a critical year in the history of capitalism, so for our lecture series. Um, how did Europe react to that? Um, it left a massive crater. It left a massive crater, and it left the crater particularly in the country which is by sheer accident of geography, the central and most important one in Europe, politically, historically, and that's Germany. Um, the Versailles Treaty had already been a fairly disastrous idea, as many people very quickly realized, because very simply, if you are interested in the welfare of you know, this thing, Europe, then you have to abstract perhaps from moral uh, considerations. I mean, notions of the Greek crisis come into mind. But um, if you cripple the central economy in the continent, and prevented from establishing political stability, institutional stability, then the center is always weak. And in a time when economies are in crisis, in a time when societies and ideals are in crisis, this was a, re a recipe for disaster.
um, you have to imagine a state with 40% unemployment. Um, it very quickly ceases to be a state and of course it also means that the welfare payments exceed by so far anything that comes in that you're in a downward spiral. Um, that contributed to a spirit of radicalization in Europe, of bitter rivalries and I sort of asked myself writing about this interwar time now, the First World War, in fact, the years before the war already are a time of tremendous energy. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic, it's sort of gigantic shot of adrenaline into, into this, uh, this continent and this culture. And the energy, of course, transforms itself into bellicose martial energy of the war. But where did it go afterwards? Um, it wasn't just that everybody was very tired. I think this energy, which was driven by industrialization, driven by technological change, by scientific change, that was so rapid that really within a generation the world changed entirely. This energy went into almost wars within the societies. War between, wars between fascists and socialists, wars between the poor and the rich, wars across what was then called racial divides. Um, it was a time of terrible antagonisms and it was almost also a time of sort of competing utopias, almost petite, competing messiahs. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm an historian, but I keep living today and therefore I keep drawing parallels. But um, when you look at the biographies of young Islamic terrorists, um, they are people who are sort of on the outside of society, who were by the undoubted European racism also marginalized. But ultimately, there are people who want to live for something. You know, they've had all had their time of drinking a lot and smoking pot and sort of hanging around and finding, you know, crisis. And they're so glad to find something to live for because our society offers them very few ready-made solutions of you know, this is what you have to do. Those times are over. Um, when you had your estate, your place in the world, and you were held to that. That's called a free society, but freedom can be, can be quite, quite something quite hard to bear. If the element of uncertainty, answers. perhaps, as well. Yes. I mean, it seems to be something that characterizes the uncertainty, the, the contingency of it. Yeah. Um, now, in the 1920s and 30s, there were millions of people who saw that the democratic states were going nowhere. Their economies were collapsing or tottering. Uh, social cohesion was shot. And perhaps most importantly, the First World War, I think, was a terrible crisis of values because millions of men were sent into the field for God and fatherland or for king and country or for the emperor or for some august ideal. And they were crushed by machines out there. And they came back and that whole moral system that had perhaps been cruel, perhaps been unjust, but had been relatively stable, was broken. And people were desperately looking for something to believe in. And I think that is a great hour for ideologies. And you talk um, also, I think, in your book about the different political ideologies that emerge that are very nationalistic. They, they hark back to sort of either religious ideologies or the Roman Empire in the case of El Duce. Um, can you draw parallels today with, for example, Putin's Russia, um, the allegiance to far right wing parties in Europe? Um, the development of certain immigration policies? I think there is a definite parallel, of course, in the fact that there's the look for a, looking for an easy answer. I also think we mustn't be hysterical. I mean, Europe in the 1920s and 30s was a continent on its knees, economically and in many other ways. Today, we've never been so wealthy before. Now, you can argue about how real that wealth is um, and how speculative it is, um, how much of it will remain. But, I mean, certainly after two generations of peace and prosperity, the situation is not the same as in the 20s and 30s. People now all of a sudden start about talking about the Weimarization of Europe. Um, but 
I think the situation from which we come is very different, but I think also because of that, it is particularly important to remember that liberal democracies are a very recent invention. They have been existing in the world for not even a hundred years. And they can vanish just as quickly. On that There's... happy note, I think we're going to have to say thank you very much. And um, looking forward to your lecture. Okay, thank you.